What a text that we're about to dive into. We're going to read today one of the most important, central, foundational texts in all the Bible. And I can't wait to dive into it because as foundational as it is, I'm convinced that many Christians, people who call themselves Christians, we'll just make it that general, are missing it either completely or we're missing the wonder of what it means and how it totally transforms our lives, our families, our purpose in the world. I've prayed that for many of you today, a light bulb would go on in your mind and your heart in such a way that you would look back at today and you would say, that's the day I got it. I saw what was all what it was all about, what my life is all about, what being a follower of Jesus is all about, either for the first time or maybe in a a fresh way. And if you're not a Christian, so if you're visiting with us or you're exploring Christianity, what we're about to read is not just gonna show you what Christianity is about, it's gonna show you what your life is about, what you are made for. And I know that's bold to say, but just hang with me. So God, please open our eyes, bring about light bulbs that need to happen in our minds and our hearts as we listen to your word. Mark chapter 12. So start with me in verse 28. I'll have it up here on the screen as well. And one of the scribes, so just pause real quick here when we hear the context and this mention of a scribe. So if you've been here the last few weeks, you know, we we talked about this is happening on a Tuesday. By Thursday night, Jesus is going to be arrested. By Friday night, Jesus is going to be dead. And it's all because groups of people are working against him. It started at the end of chapter 11 with a group of chief priests and scribes and elders coming to Jesus. Then Pharisees and Herodians after that. Then Sadducees, what we looked at. Last week, now one of these scribes comes up to Jesus and hears people disputing with each other and seeing that Jesus was answering them well, asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? So a little background here. These scribes had identified 613 different commandments from God. 248 of them were positive as in, do this, 365 of them were negative, as if, don't do this. And then the scribes took those commandments and they ranked them into less or more important commandments. So the scribe asks, out of 613, which one is the most important of all? And in verse 29, Jesus answered, the most important is hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. Now, Jesus is not giving a new commandment here. He's quoting from the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, probably the most famous verse in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. If you were to walk into somebody's home in the days of Deuteronomy, this verse would be on the walls. People would wear it on themselves. This verse was everywhere. It was central. The only difference in Mark 12 is Jesus adds, and with all your strength. But the point is the same. Love God with all See it over and over again, four times. All you are, all you have. This is the most important commandment. And then Jesus continues. Doesn't just stop with number one. He also gives number two. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And that is also a quote from the Old Testament. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, where God in his law had said to his people, You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. But now, for the first time in history, Jesus is putting these two commandments from Deuteronomy 6 and Leviticus chapter 19 side by side. 
Love God with all you are, all you have. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then he says, there is no commandment greater than these. Now, we're going to come back to this because those two verses, Mark, or three verses, Mark 12, 29 through 31, are the foundational verses for life, foundational in the Bible. But just see what happened real quickly after Jesus said this. The scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. You've truly said that he is one and there's no other besides him. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding, with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Now, it's interesting. Up until this point, scribes, when they talk like this, like saying, Jesus, you're, you're right, teacher, they didn't actually mean it. They were trying to trap him. But in this instance, it seems like this guy's actually giving it. And maybe he was sent to trap Jesus, But now hearing what Jesus is saying, he's thinking, huh, you may be right. It's the only time in all the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, where a scribe is pictured as favorably disposed to Jesus. And the next verse, verse 34, is the only time in the Gospels where Jesus commends a scribe. Watch this. When Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. I love that. Here's what I have in my mind as I read it. I picture the chief priests and the scribes and elders and Pharisees and Sadducees and Herodians. They're all watching or at least hearing about this scribe, one of their own, listening to Jesus and saying, I think you're right. And Jesus looks at him and says, I think you're close. And meanwhile, they're all saying, all right, that's it. Mayday, mayday. We're out. No more questions. It's not doing us any good. So what was it about what Jesus said that seems to have won the scribe over and is seeming to shut everyone else down? Well, what Jesus just said in verses 29 to 31 summarized the whole Bible and the whole purpose of life in three verses. In fact, in Matthew's account of Jesus saying these words, Jesus added, on these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Like all of God's word hangs on these commandments. And they are interesting commandments, aren't they? Just think about it. The most important commandment is to love God with all you are and all you have. Well, who is giving that command? Ultimately, it's God, right? God the Father in Deuteronomy, God the Son, God in the flesh, Jesus here in Mark. So God is commanding everyone, including you and me, to love God, to love himself. The most important thing you can do in your life, God says, is to love me. And not just can do in your life but must do in your life. This is a commandment. God says, you must love me. Does this not raise questions in your mind? Like, is this self-centered of God? For him to command us to love him? And then, is it love if it has to be commanded? Isn't love felt, not forced? Is love an obligation or is love an affection? Is love something we have to do or is love something we want to do? I love that (laughs) a little one over here, I don't know how old, but I think a younger voice yelled yes to some of these questions. Like, is love something we have to do? I think that was the moment where I heard yes. So these are thoughts we need to grapple with. If we're going to feel the weight and wonder of what these verses mean for our lives. So let's think about these two most important commands. And let's just ask some basic questions. You might write these down, four questions to be exact. Number one, let's ask, who is giving these commands? And we've already said God is, but let's be more specific. Who is God? The one giving these commands is God, who is the only sovereign, infinitely holy, 
supremely satisfying, perfectly loving, creator of all and Lord over all. Now, I know that's a loaded sentence, and we don't have time to unpack a theology of God in depth, but we need to realize who's giving this command, who God is. From the very beginning of the Bible, Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God. He is the only, there's only one God, no other gods. The only sovereign, meaning independent, self-governing, authoritative being in all the universe who is infinitely holy in all of his attributes. He is without error and he is without equal. He is supremely satisfying. Everything that is beautiful and powerful and peaceful and joyful and just emanates from God. And he is perfectly loving. God is love. God defines love with his very being. He is the creator of all things, including all people. Everything and everyone has its genesis in God. And he is Lord over all things, which means he rules and reigns over everything and everyone. This is who is giving these commands. Which then leads to a second question. Well, who is receiving these commands? Who is God giving these commands to? And the answer is us, who are all created by God in the image of God to enjoy relationship with God. Again, this is a loaded sentence, but just think about what it's saying. Again, from the very beginning of the Bible. So I'll put this verse up here on the screen then come back to this description if you're writing it down. But Genesis 1, 26 and 27 says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So God has created us unlike anything else in all creation, unlike the fish or the birds or the livestock or just animals and insects and mountains and oceans and stars and planets. God has created you and me in his own image, like him, so that we, unlike anything else in all creation, enjoy relationship with him. This is awesome. See the dignity and worth and honor and meaning and purpose you have right where you are sitting right now. You are personally Created, made, formed, fashioned by God himself in the image of God. When you look in the mirror, you see a being created in the image of God to enjoy, for the purpose of enjoying relationship with God. And don't forget who the God is here. You've been created to enjoy relationship with the only sovereign, infinitely holy, supremely satisfying, perfectly loving being in all the universe. It's what you are made for. Just think about the meaning this gives to your life. This is who you are, which then leads then to the third question. So third question is, why? Why does God give these commands to us? And not just these commands, but all kinds of commands. Why does God tell us what to do? And the answer the Bible gives from the very beginning is because God lovingly desires our highest good and greatest joy. This is also clear from the beginning of the Bible. God's first commands to us Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. Right after we read what we read just a second ago about man and woman being made in God's image, the Bible says God blessed them 
And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So God blesses man and woman and God says to them, he commands them, be fruitful and multiply. God is telling his people how to experience fruitful life to the full all over the earth. And then in the next chapter, Genesis chapter 2, verse 16, we read, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Does that sound like God wants to make life miserable for man and woman? No, this is God saying, I'm giving you every tree in the garden to eat and enjoy, except for one. And if you eat of that one, you shall surely die. And I'm telling you this, God says, so you won't eat of it. So you'll live, which is what I want for you forever. And thus begins the story of how God lovingly gives his people commands always, always, always for their good. So here's just a few other examples that make the point. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 24, 25. The word Deuteronomy means the second law, the recounting of God's commands. And the Bible says the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes to fear the Lord our God for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as we are this day. And it will be righteousness for us, if we are careful to do all this commandment before the Lord our God as he has commanded us. God's commands are always for our good. Things will be right. They'll be good for us when we obey his commands. Or look at Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 39 through 41. God says, I will give them one heart and one way. That they may fear me forever for their own good. And the good of their children after them. I will make them an everlasting covenant, and I will not turn away from doing good to them. And I will put the fear of me in their hearts that they might not turn from me. I will rejoice in doing them good. I will plant them in this land in faithfulness with all my heart and my, all my soul. What a picture. God wants good for us, good for our children after us. God rejoices. What a Word, God to say, I rejoice in doing good for you. With all his heart and with all his soul, with all that God is and all that God has, God lovingly desires our highest good and greatest joy. Are you hearing this? Just make it personal. Why does God give commands to you? Because God the only sovereign, infinitely holy, supremely satisfying, perfectly loving, creator of all and Lord of all, this God lovingly desires your good and your greatest joy. This is, this is really good news. What if God didn't desire this? What if the only sovereign, all-powerful being in the universe did not desire this? If he didn't desire our good, we'd be hopeless. It would be horrible. But God always and lovingly desires your highest good and greatest joy. And if that's true, which we've seen clearly it is, then the question is, do you desire this? Do you desire your highest good and greatest joy? Do you want your good? Do you want your joy? If so, then what should you do? Well, that leads to our final question, number four. How can you experience your highest good and greatest joy? And I'm making this personal to you because I'm going to assume you want to know the answer to this question. I assume you want your highest good and greatest joy. Who would not want that? We all want this. Even people's attempts today to find your truth or live your truth are attempts to experience your good and your joy. 
And this is where Mark 12 comes in because this is the question that Jesus is answering in our passage. If God's commands are for our highest good and greatest joy, then what's the most important one or two? And Jesus says, well, there are two, and all the others hang on these two. These two just explain how to do the other two, but if, if you get these two, you will have your highest good and greatest joy. If you just get these two, so what are they? And Jesus says, the way to your highest good and greatest joy is first. Love God with all you are and all you have. Love God with all you are and all you have, and you will experience your highest good and your greatest joy. And now it all starts to make sense. Let's connect the dots. Because God is the only sovereign, infinitely holy, supremely satisfying, perfectly loving being in all the universe. So if you want your highest good and greatest joy, then you want God. Because there's no one and nothing in this world that's better than him, greater than him, more satisfying than him, more loving than him. So if you truly desire your highest good and greatest joy, that desire will inevitably lead you to God. Which, now keep putting the pieces together, is the whole reason Jesus came. Because you and I have all been separated from God by our sin against God. You and I have all been separated from the only one who can satisfy our souls. You and I have all done what Adam and Eve did in Genesis chapter 3. We've turned aside from love for God, and we've loved other things and other people, namely ourselves, more than God. Adam and Eve foolishly loved. They desired a piece of fruit more than they desired and loved God. And we have foolishly done the same with all sorts of things in this world, thinking our ways are better than his ways. And it has left us empty and broken apart from God and actually deserving the just and holy judgment that flows from God. But the good news of the Bible is that even though we have turned from God, God has pursued us. God has come to us in the person of Jesus. And just a few days after Jesus said these words in Mark chapter 12, Jesus died on a cross to pay the price for sinners against God. And just a few days after that, Jesus rose from the dead in victory over sin so that anyone, anywhere, no matter who you are or what you have done, anyone who turns from their sin and themselves and trusts in Jesus as Savior and Lord will be forgiven of all their sin and restored to relationship with God. This is the greatest news in all the world. You, right where you are sitting, can be restored to love relationship with the only sovereign, infinitely holy, supremely satisfying, perfectly loving, creator of all and Lord over all. You can be in relationship with him now and forever and experience ultimate satisfaction for your soul in God. That's the gospel. So, do you want your highest good and greatest joy? Then love God with all you are and all you have. And now we come back to our questions at the beginning. So, is this self-centered of God? For God to say, love me. And as soon as you ask that question, in light of all we've seen, you realize... Well, of course it is. And that's really good news. 
Because if God is the only sovereign, infinitely holy, supremely satisfying, perfectly loving being in all the universe, and he loves us, then what's he going to give us? Some cash? Some power in this world? Health for a time? Comfort? No, all of those things fade. None of those things last. They ultimately will leave us empty. If God really loves you, then what's he going to give you? He's going to give you himself. He's going to give you supreme satisfaction in him that will never, ever fade, that 10 trillion years from now will be brighter than you realize even right now. He's going to give you perfect love that will last forever and ever in him. God loves you so much, he gives you himself. He gives you a love relationship with the one who's better than everyone and everything in this world put together. Which then leads to our other question. So then, is loving God an obligation? Or is loving God an affection? Is love for God something we have to do? Or is love for God something we want to do? And the answer is yes. And you say, well, how can it be both? Well, just think. A couple of human illustrations of this. Edward John Cornell authored a book on Christian commitment. And at one point he writes, suppose a husband asks his wife if he must kiss her goodnight. Her answer is, you must, but not that kind of a must. And what she means is, it's more than a must in the sense of a husband feeling like he's obligated to kiss his wife, although it's right for him to love her as her husband that's right and good, but there's something more needed. And what will make that marriage life-giving is if he must kiss her because he loves her so much. It's a beautiful blend of good and right obligation and good and right affection. Or uses another example, saying, suppose a mother rushes to help her terrified child she acts out of spontaneous love, and she would even be offended by the suggestion that she must help her child from a legal sense of duty. So in one sense, yes, the mother has an obligation. As a mother, it is right to care for her child. But she must run to him. Why? Not merely because of a legal sense of obligation, so much more than that. She must run to her child because she has such affection for her child. So must we love God? Well, yes, in one sense we must because he alone is God. He alone is supremely lovely. But certainly that's not the whole story. We don't come to church and read the Bible and pray because we feel obligated. That's not Christianity. No, we love God and we must come to church and read his word and pray. Not because we feel obligated, but because we know our souls will find satisfaction. Our souls will find our highest good and greatest joy in God. Which begs the question then, is that true of you? That's what I mean when I say so many suppose Christians miss this. If your spiritual life feels like you're just supposed to go to church or read the Bible or pray or share the gospel, then you may be missing the point. You're created for a love relationship with the God of the universe. The reality is so many supposed Christians actually love this world and tack on Jesus to your life here so you can have heaven in the next world. Just look at our lives. So many supposed Christians come to church every once in a while when it's convenient, pray here or there, 
read the Bible here or there. Oh, we spend our time and our money on all kinds of things in this world, money and prosperity and positions, possessions and comforts and ease and health. That's not Christianity. That's nominal Christianity. Christianity in name only. It's not real. It's not following Christ. Following Christ means you have found in God something, someone who is better than everything in this world, and you want him more than you want money or prosperity or possessions or comfort or ease or even health itself because you know your highest good and greatest joy are not found in these things. They're found in God. So you want God and you love God with all you are and all you have in Christianity, in Jesus Christ. You are now free from the pursuit of empty, fading pleasures in this world because you've found highest joy, highest good and greatest joy in loving God. And don't miss it. There's so much here because now when you face trials in this world and you lose some of these things, you lose people or prosperity or comfort or health, you've not put your hope in those things. You put your hope in the God who's greater than all those things. And even if, if you lose them all, you'll still have love relationship with the supremely satisfying, perfectly loving creator of all. In other words, you have a joy that transcends any circumstances in this world. You have highest good and greatest joy in the God over this world. This frees you for a totally different kind of life. It actually frees you for real life with the one who created your life. And, so now this is the second part, the way to your highest good and greatest joy. Love God with all you, are, all you have and love others as yourself. So how does this go together? Oh, this is so good. So think about this command from Leviticus 19 and Mark 12. God, Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself. What a picture. God, Jesus, assumes, clearly knows we love ourselves. And many people in our self-esteemed, obsessed culture skew this passage to say, Jesus is commanding us here to love ourselves because we can't love others if we don't love ourselves. So we need to start with loving ourselves. Only problem is, that's not what Jesus says. Jesus says, you, you already love yourself. You, you want food for yourself. You want clothes for yourself. You want a place to live for yourself. You want friends for yourself. You want happiness for yourself. Even when we make foolish decisions that are unhealthy for our lives, it's because we're convinced making those decisions will be good for ourselves. And follow this. Jesus is not saying it's bad to want food, clothes, place to live, friends, happiness, and so on. God actually gives us desire for those things. What Jesus is saying, though, is just as you want those things for yourself and you make sure you have those things, I'm commanding you to want those things for others and to make sure they have those things. So if your neighbor is without food, Help them get some food. If your neighbor doesn't have a place to live, help them find a place to live. If your neighbor is without friends, be their friend. And as your neighbor wants happiness, help them find happiness, which then leads back to the first command, right? Because if you truly want, love your neighbor, then what do you want for them? You want their highest good and greatest joy. And where is their highest good and greatest joy found? In God. Which means to truly love your neighbor is to do all you can to lead them to love God. And the whole picture comes first, full circle. Put it all together. Connect the dots. How can you experience your Highest good and greatest joy? First and foremost, 
by loving God with all you are, all you have, turning from yourself and your sin and the pursuit of things in this world, loving, seeking, being satisfied in relationship with God. And as you love God, then the overflow of that is loving the people around you in the same way that you want them to know the love of God. You want them to find life in loving God. And this becomes, so now just see the tentacles here. This becomes your guide for marriage. You live as a husband or a wife to reflect God's love for your spouse. You live to help them find life in loving God. This becomes your reason for parenting. You live to reflect God's love for your kids and to help them find life and love for God. You don't live, not ultimately, to help them get great grades, do great at sports, go on great dates, learn to make a great living. No, over and above all that, you live to help them love a great God. It changes what you do with your kids. This becomes your reason for every facet of life, whoever you are, single or married, student or adult. Wherever you go to school or work, whatever you do, you live to help others. This week, find life in love relationship with God. You reflect his love for them. You point them to his love for them. And you might wonder, well, wait a minute, how does the second part, loving others as myself, how does that lead to, how does this lead to my highest good and my greatest joy if I love others as myself? I love that question. I want you to think about it with me. Just think some examples. Have you ever led someone else to faith in Jesus? I guarantee you that if you have, or if you ever do, you will experience immeasurable joy in realizing that through your life, this person's life has been transformed for all of eternity. Like that's, that's joy. That's infinitely better than watching your team win a World Series. Like, you just saw somebody's life change for the next 10 trillion years and you got to be a part of it, that was awesome. On a much simpler level, if you're a parent, have you ever helped your child accomplish something that made them proud? If so, what did that bring you? I'm guessing it brought you joy. Or as a friend, have you ever helped a friend in need walk through something that was difficult? What did that bring you? I'm guessing it brought you joy. Do you know why? Because God has actually designed your heart to find great joy in loving other people. And now we see, at least I pray, we hope, I pray and hope we see that these two greatest commandments from God go totally against the grain of this world. This world says, that the way to live, the way to life is rebelling against God and doing things on your own. Love yourself, trust yourself, live your truth. And God says, no, I love you so much and I have made you for so much more than that. I love you so much. I have made a way for you to experience life now and forever in a love relationship with me and my supreme satisfaction of you. And as you love me, and I set you free from the fading pleasures of this world, I also set you free to find deep and lasting joy in leading others to experience life in my love for them now and forever. This is what our lives are all about. So much more we could dive into here, but I mean, just so much flows from this. But let me just stop here, and I want to leave you with two questions. So one... What lesser loves do you need to repent of today in order to find your highest good and greatest joy and love for God with all you are and all you have? Just honestly consider in your life, are there things that you love or are tempted to love more than God in your life or anywhere 
close, for that matter, to love for God. Maybe it's someone in this world. Or maybe it's something. Health. Money. Sex. Sports. Status. Position. Power. Control. Comfort your name or reputation, so many things. And I would add so many good things. None of the things I just mentioned are bad in and of themselves. But none of them are ultimate. And all of them, if we pursue them over God, will leave us empty. So what lesser loves do you need to confess before God? God, I so prone to love, to trust, to pursue, to want this person, that thing more than you. And I repent of that today. You're better. You're better. I want you more than I want this, God. I want to love you with all I am and all that I have. So help me to let go of lesser loves. It doesn't mean you don't love that person. We've already seen that. It doesn't mean You don't have affection for good things in this world, but it does mean you see God as the author of all those good things, and you love him as the giver far, far, far more than you love the gift. And that leads to question number two. What are practical ways God is calling you to love others as yourself starting this week? I just want to encourage you to think through one, two, three practical ways. God is calling you to love others as yourself, specifically with the goal of leading them to life and love for God. So are there some steps you need to take in your marriage or your parenting or in your relationship with your parents or relationships with friends or neighbors co-workers and people without Christ. There are some ways that God is calling you to play this out in the church. So many different directions this could go. Just start with a couple, few practical ways God is calling you to love others as yourself. So take a moment. Let's reflect on these questions and then I and other location pastors will lead us after that. As you continue to pray and reflect, I just want to ask a question all across this room to each and every person. I wish I could sit down with each and every person, but just to ask you individually, are you 
in a relationship with God marked by love. His love for you and your love for him. I'm not asking if you've grown up in church. I'm not asking what religious practices you have or have not done. I'm asking, are you in a love relationship with God? If the answer to that question is not a resounding yes in your heart, then either God is inviting you for the first time to enter into relationship with him through faith in Jesus. Or, or God is calling you back to him. Maybe you have been in relationship with him, but that's, that's grown cold. Or, or maybe you've just missed the point. Either way, I invite you to pray right now. Say, God, I want you God, I desire you. I, I want a relationship with you marked by love with all my heart and all my soul and all my mind and all my strength. Today, maybe for some of you to pray, God, I'm placing my faith in Jesus today. Not just to give me a get out of hell free card. I'm placing my faith in Jesus to forgive me of my sin and restore me to relationship with you. Trusting in Jesus as Savior and Lord of my life because I want to live my life loving you and experiencing, enjoying relationship with you. And others just to pray, God, I've, I've wandered from you. I've I've missed this in you, and I want this in you. I want a life marked by love for you that makes everything else in this world pale in comparison. As you pray that, just know that's God speaking to your heart, inviting you into this relationship, and he delights in you. He delights in you, and he desires you. Oh, God, we praise you for this reality that you desire us, that you delight in us, that you pursue us, that you run after us. God, thank you for sending your son, Jesus. We praise you for dying on the cross for our sin, for opening the door into restoration, reconciliation, redemption with you. And we say, God, help us all. Even as I was reflecting, God, you know, you just exposed some things in my heart that I needed to see. We repent today of lesser loves. Pray that you would draw us into deeper, closer, wholehearted love relationship with you. Help us to see you for who you are as supremely better and everything in this world put together and to live with this kind of love for you and to live with this kind of love for others. God, we pray that you'd help us in the church to love each other as ourselves. And in this, in our homes, to love each other as ourselves. In our city, in the places where we scatter all throughout this week, God, we pray that we would be the most loving people all across the city in ways that I pray would lead others to life in your love for them. God, we thank you so much for your word, for these two commands. And we pray that by your grace, your spirit in us, you would help us to live them out to the full and to experience in you our highest good and greatest joy. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.